Welcome to Cherry Grove Friends Church. Today is Sunday, January 15th, 2023. Good morning and welcome to this meeting for worship at Cherry Grove Friends Church. There's just too many wonderful people to talk to here. It's hard to start on time, but we're going to do it. Um, today, I would love to open with 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And then we have from the New City Catechism inside your bulletin, you'll see it down here, um, the question number three and the answer. And if you don't mind reading with me the answer, but I will read the question. Question three, how many persons are there in God? There are three persons in the one true and living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are the same in substance, equal in power and glory. In this, we see that Paul's statement of God's grace and the work of our salvation is the work of all the persons of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father's plan, the Son's work, and the Spirit's power. And so we are saved unto new life as new people with a new purpose. Do you believe this? Yes. 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 Well, I would love to pray for this us uh, this morning. Um, I would love to pray for this this morning. Join me. God, our Father, we welcome you today with one thing in common. We are all in need of your grace, your forgiveness. And as we come into this place together, we bring our joys, our sorrows, our sins, and things we're celebrating. We lay these things at your feet as we desire to move into the only reasonable response to your forgiveness and grace. We want to worship you well, to know your peace that passes understanding, and to be unified in that we confess in that we who confess Christ as our Savior are one family, united by your forgiveness, by your spirit, and your lordship over our lives. We invite you to transform our hearts and minds as we worship you, hear your word, fellowship, and listen. Make us, together, willing to follow as you lead and trust you as you do. Amen. Following this first song, there will be a time, a brief moment of silence as we prepare our hearts to hear from God. For those of you who, are, who can stand, please stand as we sing our first hymn.
may be seated. We're going to continue this morning reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Pray with me. Almighty God, we, your people, believe your word that we lack nothing, but that you have given all that we need for life and godliness. We know it because you have told us and we trust in your words. You, O Lord, have given us immense riches of speech and of knowledge and gifted us with all that we need to do the things that you have laid before us. Father, we would confess now that we have been at times disengaged from the work in front of us. With the path that you have laid before us, that you have given us opportunities to share the good news of your son and we have drawn back. Lord God, we confess that we have seen opportunities to serve one another as you have commanded us when you washed our feet so that we should wash one another's feet, but at times we have chosen not to. Lord God, we confess that we have not cared for this world you have made in obedience to your very first command to humanity to keep this land and subdue it and have instead exploited, ignored, and left desolate your good gifts to us. Lord God, we confess that we are not what we should be, that we are not what we will be, that we are not what we ought to be, But Lord God, you have reminded us that you have given us all we need for life and godliness, and that by your grace, we are not what we were, and that in your rich mercy, we will someday be what you have called each and every one of us to be. May we look at ourselves with your eyes, daily confessing our imperfections, throwing ourselves anew on your mercy, pleading the blood of Christ alone, and looking for the resurrection you have promised. May we look at one another with your eyes, seeing the new creation at work in our brothers and sisters coming alongside each other in this death to self that leads to eternal life and bearing witness to the watching world that we are a people made new by divine power who bear a burden for the life of the world, that we are desperate sinners, but Jesus Christ is our great savior that death haunts our steps, but resurrection follows after, that the world may appear dark, but Christ reigns and will soon make all things new. O God, may we, your people, believe that you are indeed the faithful one who gives us your rich mercy and all we need to accomplish the work before us, and that you will keep all those you have called for the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us continue with 1 Corinthians 1, 8, and 9, the following verses. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of Christ Jesus. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. People of God, do you believe this? Your Father has called you, and He will keep you to the end. He is faithful, you are forgiven, and you are being made new day by day. For all of the work that they're doing for our sister, um, it's a beautiful expression of the body of Christ, um, and they've, they've done a lot of work. Um, and uh, it will not go unrewarded. You know, we believe that that, that work matters and that there will come a judgment day when God richly rewards those who uh, wash the feet of their brothers and sisters. 
Um, I have a couple of more little announcements I'm going to talk up more about in the uh, business meeting this afternoon, which I will encourage you to attend. There will be sandwiches as well, because I, I get hooked by food, so I don't know. <laughs> A um, couple of things. We're going to be uh, restarting a Sunday school class um, in February and March. They're going to be centered around two little teeny tiny books that I'm going to uh, sculpt a class around. One is called Conversion, and the other called is Discipling. So the themes are going to be Conversion and Discipling. I know, it's crazy. <clears throat> And that will partly lead up to a conference that is happening the first weekend of March on the 3rd and 4th that I would like to invite any of you that wish to join me at on the subject of evangelism uh, that will be happening in Portland. Uh, some of you have attended one of these conferences before on the subject of worship with me. It's a good time. Uh, ask me questions about that or I'll talk about it more this afternoon. Uh, one last thing. I'm going to ask uh, Doug and Elizabeth Smith to come up here for a minute. and also any of our elders who are here. So we love these guys, um, if you didn't know. <laughs> um, Doug, do you want to say just a second what, uh, what has happened? And i use the thing oh, so people sure. can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're really excited because it seems like God has uh, led us to a church that's in walking distance of where we live, and uh, we hadn't anticipated this, but it's like Elizabeth has blossomed because she's now close enough to where she lives where if she has a bout of vertigo, I can get her home immediately, and so she's just joining this and joining that, and she's part of this ladies' thing and such, and we we just, we see God just putting things together for us. And what's so awesome is the incredible support that uh, Mark and Laura Lee have given us. And uh, just to bless us and say, take as much time as you need. And that's what's kind of been going on with us. So it seems like now is the time to, uh, I guess, send us off with, yeah. So thank you. That, that is our intent, is to send these guys with a blessing because, well, we love one another, and we are a family of the body of Christ here. There is a broader family, um, and we are going to send them into the care of another expression of that body. Um, it's, uh, it's sad for us, although I, I think we might see them around occasionally anyway. So, uh, but um, it's sad for us to, to not have them here every week, but it's a joy for uh, us to send someone forth to another family of God. So um, we're going to pray over them for a minute, um, and if you guys just uh, pray with us. That would be wonderful. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the gift that has been Doug and Elizabeth to this body. I want to thank you for the, the time that they have invested in this congregation and the gift they have been to us, as well as the gifts they have received uh, by your will from us. I pray as they go forth to uh, a new family that, uh, that you have provided for them uh, in, in such amazing ways, being so close to their home, uh, that they would be a blessing there as well as they've been to us, and that that uh, family would bless them enormously. Lord God, we know that as we send forth anyone, we will miss them, but that one day we will all stand together before your throne and see one another and say, I, I knew that it was always possible that this is what you could be, because you will have made all things new in them and in us. Until that day, Lord God, may you bless them, their footsteps, the mission that you have laid in front of them, and bless us, and give our hearts peace in their absence. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. It is a beautiful thing to be part of an extended family um, and to know that that extended family will one day once again be one whole family. Uh, thank you for praying with us. Um, I'm going to have Brenda come up. First, I will read from Acts chapter 8, seven, uh, 14 through 17. 
When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When we pray, this is a italics, um, when we pray, we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, God himself. Uh, so this is our time of praise and prayer. I'm just going to keep praying, because <clears throat> it's always a good idea. Um, Lord God, we have heard uh, this morning of uh, fears and griefs and burdens uh, for loved ones and for ourselves, for one another, and we... Uh, we want to reflect back gratitude to you that we are a people who can bear one another's burdens. Um, thank you for the blessing of these brothers and sisters who are, are, are able to share these things and uh, perhaps for those who are, are not confident enough to share them from the front but will share them personally. Uh, I pray that you would bring those things to mind uh, throughout our weeks. Uh, and uh, bring us into an attitude of prayer towards you, knowing that uh, you, you know all of our burdens, uh, and you know all of our griefs, and you know all of our fears. Uh, you have made our ways for us. And we lift up in prayer these, the, the hearts of those involved, that uh, all of these things that are happening would serve to open them up towards you and your love and your mercy and grace. Um, may we, in our, even in our fears and suffering and grief, uh, be a witness to your power to the world, that uh, you are indeed making all things new, even when it seems like things are quite dark. Uh, Heavenly Father, I, I want to pray that prayer not just for us, uh, but for uh, all those who call on your name in the city of Battleground. Um, I think particularly right now of the young couple who are passionate about bringing uh, young life movements to Battleground High School. Um, I pray that you would bless that effort um, and bring a, uh, a, a wonderful group of people who are passionate for your name, uh, who will share the good news of who you are uh, with the high schoolers in this city. I pray that you would bring a revival and uh, a new movement of your spirit uh, to awaken hearts to their need for repentance and to be transformed by Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord God, open up in us the awareness of how we can participate in these things that you have chosen to do. And now as we move forward in our service, Lord, I, I pray that you would open up our hearts to, uh, to your word, to hear what it is you have to say to us, um, may you uh, open, open up our hearts to your glory as we praise your name in song. Uh, may you give us an awareness uh, in that moment of, of who you are and how glorious you are that awakens our hearts to praise in ways that we could never generate ourselves. And Lord, I, I ask that you open our hearts to your spirit as you speak to us, uh, as we await and listen for your word uh, for ourselves, for one another, and for this body. We thank you for the opportunity to come to your throne and worship you. May we take every opportunity. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. So we are arrived at the center of our worship service, and we will be reading from Psalm 40 this morning. It is up on the screen. Also, I, I've started putting it in the, the page numbers in the provided Bibles in the bulletin. Um, because at least for me, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I have found that 
uh, holding something in my hand and reading it is different than looking at it on a screen. Um, so uh, Psalm 40 is on page 451 of the Brown Bibles and 803 of the Maroon Bibles. Uh, so if you want to take a second to find those, I will just keep saying words until I've given you an opportunity. <laughs> Um, and again, I plan to pr print those in the bulletin going forward so you can find them. Um, and what we're going to do, we're going to read the whole psalm out loud together, uh, and then we're going to have our worship team come up and lead us in uh, songs of worship and praise to our God, and then we're going to have a time of silence in open worship. And, and really all of these, all of these are times of, of listening and consideration as well as learning and praise and speech. Uh, so I, I encourage you in that time of open worship to, to take a moment and reflect on the words you've said, the words you've sung, um, or if it's helpful to look forward, uh, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. Uh, the page numbers on that are also listed in the bulletin. Uh, meditate on God's words, what he said to you, what you've sung to him, uh, and listen, because God does speak. Our God is a God who speaks, who calls out to us. I've said enough. All right, Psalm 40. <laughs> Please read this with me. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done for us, the things you have planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare." Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. We have a surprise for you. It's coming here on this song. Encamped along the hills of light, all Christian soldiers rise. And press the battle ere the night obscures the glowing skies. To save those lost in sin below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know. 
that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Okay, on the second verse, we ask you to stand because we know you love this song and we want you to just be part of it here. <laughs> His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We walk the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph nod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept over every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To those that overcome the foe, white robes above are given. Before the angels they shall know their names announced in heaven. Then on the heavenly heads of lights, a light with hearts will flame will quell the armies of the night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. You may be seated and thank you. On the mountain's height or over the stormy sea, it may not be at the battlefront, my Lord will have need of me. But if by a still small voice he calls to pass, I do not know. I'll answer, dear Lord, with my hand in thine. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, or mountain, or plain, or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. Perhaps today there are loving words which Jesus would have me speak. There may be now in the paths of sin some wanderer I should seek. O oh, Savior, if Thou wilt be my guide, though dark and rugged the way, my voice shall echo the message sweet, I'll say what You want me to say. I'll go where You want me to go, dear Lord, or mountain, or plain, or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. 
I'll be what you want me to be. There's surely somewhere a lowly place in earth's harvest field so wide, where I may labor through life's short day for Jesus the crucified. So trusting all of my to thy care, I know thou lovest me. I'll do thy will with a heart sincere. I'll be what you want me to be. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord or mountain, or plain, or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. God ordains is right, His holy will abideth. I will be still whatever He does, and follow where He guideth. He is my God, though dark my road, He holds me that I shall not fall. And so to him I leave it all, and so to him I leave it all. Whatever my God ordains is right, he never will deceive me. He leads me by the proper path. I know he will not leave me. I take content what he has said. His hand can turn my griefs away. And patiently I wait his day, and patiently I wait his day. Whatever my God ordains is right, though now this cup be drinking. May bitter seem to my faint heart, I take it all unthinking. My God is true, each morn anew, sweet comfort yet shall fill my heart, and pain and sorrow shall depart. And pain and sorrow shall depart. Whatever my God ordains is right, there shall my stand be taken. Though sorrow, need, or death be mine, yet I am not forsaken. My Father's care is round me there. He holds me that I shall not fall. And so to Him I leave it all. 
And so to him I leave it all. My father's care is round me there. He holds me that I shall not fall. And so to him I leave it all. And so to him I leave it all. It is a beautiful thing to hear the voices of your brothers and sisters. Um, And it's a really cool thing to, uh, I I heard that story as well that was just shared this week, to to think that, you know, these these servants of God who have been um, helping us worship well um, are now worshiping perfectly. Uh, And that will be us one day. Um, yesterday afternoon, I did my least favorite thing in the world. Um, I went to Costco on a Saturday. Um, and I, I, yeah, so you all feel sorry for me now, which I appreciate. Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't feeling super happy about it when I walked out and I got in uh, my vehicle and turned it on and I, these days, I don't actually turn on the radio very often. Usually, I'm listening to a podcast or something, but I just happened to switch the radio on. And, and what came up was a little bit. They said, up next, insights in how to be a more effective complainer. <laughs> and I thought, now this, this is quality content. <laughs> it is very important to my interests. <clears throat> So I drove home, or actually I drove to the church. I was dropping something off here. So I, I, I drove to the church, and uh, the trip was... Sh- I feel like Costco to here is long enough that they should have gotten to it, but I, I didn't get to hear the instructions on how to be a more effective complainer. And I wonder if that is actually the secret. I, I didn't get to learn it, so now I have additional complaint equity. I've always been very interested in complaint equity. Um, you know how equity works? Like you, you have a, a transformable resource. So when bad things happen to me or things that are unpleasant happen, I feel that I've built some sort of reserve <laughs> in which I can expend in complaining. And I, I would like to hear their pointers on how to do that more efficiently. I, I don't actually believe that complaint equity should be our primary concern in life, although you'll find that I enjoy talking about it. If you want to talk about complaint equity, hit me sometime. Uh, It it strikes me that among the people in Scripture who has the most right to complaint equity, uh, Mary and Joseph actually have a pretty good argument. Um, You know, we're very familiar with the story of Jesus' birth and uh, the events that both precede and and proceed from it, uh, that that maybe we don't take a minute to, to realize quite how disruptive this would have been to the lives of Mary and Joseph. Um, So what we're going to do this morning is look at passage in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. As I mentioned in the Brown Bible, that's page 784. In the Maroon one, page 1375. Um, And I'm going to ask you to listen as I read this um, and follow along. uh, And Listen for the words that are repeated in this passage and think about what this might mean. Picking up on verse 13. Um, And we are proceeding from the story of the Magi from last week, so the Magi have just left. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. 
And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go up there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and went and lived in the town called Nazareth. So fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. What was repeated through that passage? What words did you hear? Get up and went. There's obedience is the event. Obedience to what? Direction. Dreams. dreams. There were some dreams. Prophecy fulfilled. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. Happens three times. And here's the interesting thing. If you go back to those passages in the Old Testament that are referenced here by Matthew, there is 0% chance you would think that they are fulfilling this. I can almost guarantee you that nobody thought that when the prophet Micah said, out of Egypt I called my son, it meant that the Messiah's parents would have to evacuate to Egypt to avoid the slaughter of children in the city of Bethlehem. And yet, the word of God says this was to fulfill this prophecy. And the words of Jeremiah, the voice heard in Ramah, everyone knew that was about the exile. That couldn't possibly be about something that's going to happen. And he would be called a Nazarene. That, that prophecy is in the book of Judges. So what is going on here? What is Matthew telling us? What are we learning about this character of Jesus when it comes to fulfillment of prophecy? Well, I think there's a few things. First, I think we need to bear in mind that for Mary and Joseph, uh, as, as knowledgeable as they apparently were in the Word of God, I, I don't think this was not weird for them because it was fulfilling prophecy that these guys are really being jerked around. You know, they're planning to get married, and then Mary ends up pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, right. You know, who's going to believe that? And, and then when, when Je Jesus is, is about to be born, we know from the book of Luke that they are displaced to a, to a different town. They have to travel to Bethlehem. They can't find a place to stay. And then after the baby's born, they're there for a while, and shows up these three gen or these, some group of Gentiles from the East with weird gifts. And then as soon as they leave, an angel shows up and says, go to Egypt. So they go to Egypt. And a couple years later, they say, all right, go home. Would you feel jerked around? I might feel a little jerked around if it was me. I might wonder what in the world is going on. Does God even know what he's doing? <laughs> Because the things he's doing here don't seem to add up to me. There was this prophecy that our child was supposed to save Israel from their sins, but boy, what we seem to be experiencing is that he's saving us from a nice, peaceful life. But this was all to fulfill what was spoken by the prophets. You know, if you were a first century Jew, you would look at the, the prophecy of Micah, out of Egypt I've called my son, and you would look at Genesis 12, and at Genesis 45, flights to Egypt, 
Uh, Abraham goes to Egypt to escape a famine. In Genesis 49, uh, Joseph is in Egypt. These names match up. So Joseph is in Egypt and calls his family down there to escape a famine. So they escape to Egypt, and then they're called back out in the Exodus. So you think that is the fulfillment. The fulfillment of a trip to Egypt is the Exodus. But Matthew is telling us, no, the fulfillment of the trip to Egypt is Jesus. And and even the slaughter of the innocents that we read about. A horrible event. Um, I preached a whole sermon on that last year. If you want to hear about Herod and all those things, I'm not going to go that direction today, but it's there on YouTube, which is magic. YouTube. The the slaughter of the innocents. You go back to Exodus 1. What was happening? The people of Israel think about this prophecy from Jeremiah. What's happening? Well, this wicked king in Egypt is slaughtering all the baby boys. Look at Exodus 4.22 when God says, because Pharaoh has taken my firstborn son, I will take his. And you have death of innocence even among the Egyptians. So the fulfillment of, of this prophecy has to do with God's judgment on those who take unjust, unjustly take life. But Matthew is saying, no, this is about Jesus. And the return from exile in Exodus 7 and throughout the Old Testament, what we read about in Ezra and Nehemiah earlier this year, that's what it's all about, right? No, Matthew is saying it's all about Jesus. The great assurances of Scripture all find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. God spoke it, and God will accomplish it. But he won't accomplish it the way everyone thought he would. So again, if you're Mary and Joseph, and the prophecy you heard was, our child is going to save the people from their sins, but your experience is this child is going to save us from having any kind of normal life. Maybe that's true of every child. I don't know. You might start to think, does does God really know what he's doing? Will God fulfill all that he has spoken? Will he fulfill his promises? Because I don't see it. All I'm doing is running around from one end of the country to the other. I'm under threat. Awful things are happening. Will God fulfill all he has spoken? Will the son of David, the son of Abraham, we are introduced to back in Matthew 1.1, will, will he actually fulfill all those promises? I think Matthew is trying to bring us along to say, yes, and not only those promises. Yes, the promises to David, the promises to Abraham, but also every promise that God has spoken is yes in Jesus Christ. Every single one. And as we move forward through the book of Matthew, you'll find this theme repeated. But right here, it's so clear. It says, look, this happened because it was spoken and God will fulfill it. And this other thing, it also happened because God spoke it and will it fulfill it. Will God do as he has promised? That's the big question. And Mary and Joseph believed that he would. Now, can you, can you imagine being in Joseph's place for a second here? Okay, the, the, the first time that God appears to you in a dream and says, so your fiance, she's pregnant. It's my baby. That's, that's a little hard to believe, right? So, but Joseph, being a righteous man, he, you know, he, he takes God at his word. And the next time, a, Joseph gets a dream from God, says, get up and go to Egypt. And, and Joseph does it. He gets up and goes to Egypt. He's lived in Egypt for a couple of years. God shows up in a dream again and says, go, go back to that place where they're trying to kill your family. And, and let's, not be, let's not beat around the bush about this. If Herod knew who Mary and Joseph were, they were going down too. Herod was not known for... Um, limiting collateral damage. And yet, all of these things in Joseph's obedience are said to be to fulfill God's word. 
So did Joseph have to make a choice to say yes? Yes. Do we have to make a choice to say yes to God's direction in our lives? Yes. And yet this says it was to fulfill a prophecy that happened centuries ago. So could it be that when we say yes to God, it's to fulfill something we may have never heard of? That we have no idea what's going on behind the scenes? That, that, that there's a master storyteller behind all of these events of our lives that is fulfilling promises that we won't know about until the whole story is over with? I think that's what Matthew's trying to teach us. Scripture tells this beautiful story. Well, it's a terrible story and a beautiful story. And it is bookended by perfection. God made the world and it was good. And at the end, God pulls his people into a city and they sing his praises forever in a world made new. And along the way, there is a lot of story that happens. Uh, you guys probably know my, everyone knows my favorite book, right? What's my favorite book? Uh, other than the Bible, okay. Come on, that's cheating. The Lord of the Rings, right? I'm a huge Tolkien nerd, right? I love, love J.R. Tolkien. And, and you know, to, one of the things that, that uh, Tolkien talked about when he talked about storytelling, Lewis actually talks about this in On Fairy Stories as well, that, that one of the, the beautiful things about storytelling is uh, the expression of hope without guarantees. That the people in the story never know where it's going, but the storyteller knows where it's going. And the storyteller brings about this thing that Tolkien called the eucatastrophe, uh, the sudden turning of events towards good that were wholly unlooked for. Jesus Christ is the eucatastrophe, the sudden turning of towards good, wholly unlooked for, that fulfills all the promises that no one even knew needed to be fulfilled. And that is as true for us today as it was for Mary and Joseph in their day. Because this journey down to Egypt that Mary and Joseph had to take, that they took Jesus on, was not the last exile that Jesus experienced. And you will see through the book of Matthew, if you careful reading, that the entire book is a story of Jesus being thrown out, exiled, and coming back. Culminating in, of course, his final exile on a Roman cross. Dying death for us. Going into, going to hell for us and returning victorious over death for us. We don't know the things for which we need the promises to be fulfilled. But the ultimate promises have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. You know, at the, the kind of apex of the Lord of the Rings, there's this this lovely scene, I've, I've talked about it before, that when, when Samwise Gamgee sees Gandalf for the first time, realizing his friend is alive, who he thought was dead, he says, <clears throat> Tolkien puts in his mouth the words, is everything sad going to come untrue? And the, the, the implied answer that's never given is, yes! Actually, yes, everything sad is going to come untrue. Uh, not by ceasing to have been, not by the story being undone, but by it finding its fulfillment in the one for whom all things were made. Everything is yes in Jesus Christ. Even things as terrible as exile, as terrible as the slaughter of the innocents, as terrible as being from Nazareth, apparently. I, I'm, all of those things are not sad and they have become, the sadness in them has become untrue because of the one for whom they were made. Jesus Christ who makes all things new. God will fulfill all he has spoken through Jesus Christ. And that is as true for us today as it was for Mary and Joseph. So, 
if you are facing choices that God has put in front of you, and he has put them all in front of you, every choice that you have, your question should not be, am I going to make the right decision in an ultimate sense? Like, is there an ultimate right or wrong for me right here? Your question should be, what is the most faithful thing that I can do in light of the fact that in the end, everything sad is going to come untrue? What is the most faithful decision I can make knowing that there are things in this decision that I know nothing about? How am I going to make choices about what God is calling me to do? How am I going to make them differently if I believe that no matter what I choose, God is working through what I choose to do to accomplish something so much bigger than I have ever even wrapped my head around? How will that change your decision-making? How will that change the way you interact with other people? How will it change the things you're concerned about when it comes to tomorrow and the day after tomorrow? Joseph and Mary are wonderful examples of people who, they, they are among the most faithful people in all of Scripture, and they had the most right to complain. And yet you hear not one peep of complaint out of either of them. Except when Jesus ran off and decided to argue with a bunch of scholars. <clears throat> we can take as examples people like Mary and Joseph. But in the end, we are not aiming at being Mary and Joseph. Because they did what they did, understanding that their child was the one for whom all things were made. We aim at the one who suffered the great exile of death on the cross for us, and the great return of the resurrection, and the great promise fulfilled in his ascension and reigning on the throne of heaven over all creation. I want to share with you the lyrics of a song. I, um, I heard it this week. Um, maybe someday we'll sing it. Um, it's a song called All My Ways Are Known to You. Uh, and it really spoke to me as I was studying this passage and trying to um, to understand what was going on in the hearts and minds of Mary and Joseph as these main characters here. Uh, so I'm just going to read this. Uh, in days of peace and days of rest, in times of loss and loneliness, though rich or poor, your word is true that all my ways are known to you. No trial has come beyond your hand, no step I walk beyond your plan. The path is dark outside my view. Still, all my ways are known to you. I do not fear the final night, for death will be the door to life. You take my hand and lead me through, for all my ways are known to you. Open my eyes that I may see that you have made these ways for me. Open my eyes that I may see that you, my God, will walk with me. Oh, what peace that I have found wherever I may be, for all my ways are known to you. Hallelujah, they are known to you. I believe that Mary and Joseph were able to do the things that they did in obedience to God because they believed that their God was sovereign and faithful you, people of God, will be able to do the things that God has set before you, for he has given you all that you need for life and godliness. He has given you rich gifts of speech and understanding beyond what you may expect. He has blessed you with every spiritual gift needed to carry out his will in this world. And the ways he has made are known by him, and they are made for you. Our God is faithful. We're going to close the service with a very familiar song for most of you, probably. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up here. There may be no other thing we can sing more honest and raw for the Christian than the opening lines of this song. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not 
the compassion they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 I appeal to you brothers and sisters in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought and this is a comment the most united thing we can declare as the people of God is that God is faithful that God is true that God will fulfill his spoken word and make all things new Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, 
Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Um, I hope you can hang out with us for our business meeting. There are snacks being put together in the kitchen back there. So grab a sandwich, come back in here, and we will have our business meeting in just a couple minutes. If you found this video helpful or enriching to your life, you may find more of Cherry Grove Worship Services at the following link. If you wish to contact Cherry Grove Friends Church for more information, please contact our pastor, Mark Franklin. If you wish to leave a prayer request, go to our website and click on How Can We Pray For You?